Welcome to The A, a place to renew and reset life. I'm super excited, excited that you guys are here. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, on a Thursday night, Jesus got together in, in an upstairs room. Actually, many scholars would say that guy's house is this man right here, St. Mark, patron saint of this church, St. Mark Church. They got together in this room, and Jesus said, listen, listen past three years have been fabulous, but things are about to go down tomorrow. Things are about to go down. But this moment right here, I want you to live this moment even after I'm gone. You think I'll be gone. You'll think I'll be gone. But I want you to live this moment. This moment, I want this present reality to be a divine reality after I leave. He said, I want you to do this. Take this bread and this wine that you think is bread and wine. Take it. And I want you to partake of it. In a way that's above your logic, this is my body and this is my blood. He said a word that we read as remembrance. But in reality, if I expand that Greek word, what is Jesus telling his followers? This moment, I want to become a reality outside of time. Right now is a present reality. But after I'm gone, live this moment because this is a divine reality that I want you to partake of even after I'm gone. Jesus took something ordinary that reflected something extraordinary. Not reflected. It is something ordinary. Jesus took something ordinary, something visible, that transcends to something above logic and above ordinary. He's not saying, uh, be a good boy and be a good girl. I want you to take of this every once in a while so that way you can feel like you're a good Christian. No, he says, I want you not to have communion. i sorry, I don't want you to just take communion. I want you to have communion with me. Today, we are talking about our second core value here at St. Mark Church. We're in the middle of a series called The Fullness of Life. Last week, we talked about Come as you are. People who are nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And what is true of him should be true of me and should be true of you. And today we're talking about our second core value, which is called transcendent worship. This is, sorry, this is St. Mark's house, uh, the upper room. Uh, if you have not gone, I highly recommend going to the Holy Land. It's one thing to read the stuff. It's another thing to walk through the stuff. But anyway, our second core value is transcendent worship. Liturgical and personal worship points us to something so much bigger than ourselves. Our participation in the sacramental life is the foundation of our ancient faith and allows us to enter into a transformational life in Jesus. This is a loaded core value, and this is a loaded explanation. Like, come as you are, everyone can understand. People who are nothing like Jesus like Jesus, and I should be like him. That's easy to understand. That's easy to understand. Now, all of a sudden, a lot of us are lost by looking at the first word, transcendent. So this is like a loaded uh, uh, core value. And to be honest, maybe later on, we'll just do a whole series just on this core value, because I love this core value, and this is the foundation of who we are, of people who follow Jesus, this is the foundation of what happens on that Thursday night in that upper room at St. Mark's house. Let's just kind of break down some definitions real quick. Worship, we hear it all the time. Yeah, come to worship, come to worship. But what is that? What is worship? Is that just coming to me just about my head? Is that me coming to do the sign of the cross? Is that me saying I love you, Jesus? What is worship? Worship is a reverence offered to a divine being or supernatural power. Reverence offered to a divine being or supernatural power. If I'm giving reverence to something else, then that means I understand that I'm here and there is a being that is supernatural that is here. For me to give reverence to something else, that means I am here and there's something that is here. There is someone that is here. There is a reverence, there is a supernatural being, there is a divine being that is here. Even, even the core word of worship comes from the word worth. For me to give worth to something, as I'm giving worth to something else, that means for me to give worth to something else, I have to understand that I'm here and there is something here. The first word of the core value is transcendent. Not a word that you hear a lot. The word transcendent is being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge. 
being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge. This is a hard one for us to grasp, the word transcendence, because we like everything to be explained to us right here, right now. If it's outside of my logic, it does not exist. If there's no evidence, it doesn't exist. But the word transcendence means it's something that there is something above my logic, something above my comprehension, something that's outside of space, something that's outside of time, something that's outside of matter that exists. For us to worship means I'm giving reverence to someone or something that is outside of my logic. Transcendent worship is me giving reverence to something or someone that is outside of my logic. For 2,000 years, for 2,000 years, anytime there was a group of people that wanted to get more out of life, and they ended up coming to the dead end of knowing who their Heavenly Father is, and they found out who God is, they got to a point where they said, this being, this divine being, I can't really describe him. I can't describe him. But the best way for me to describe him is to describe what he is not. And there's a, for those who want to study deeper into this, this is called apophatic theology. It's describing a divine being by describing who he is not. We'll say that he is outside of time. He's not limited to time. He's outside of time. We'll say that he is incomprehensible, cannot be comprehended. We'll say that he is ineffable. That I, I, there's no words that I can articulate to, to describe. Because the second I start using words to describe who he is, now I'm limiting God, who is a, our father. Now I'm starting to describe him in this way, in a limited way. Even when St. John said, you know what? I followed this guy for three years. Like I, followed, like I saw him do crazy, crazy miracles. Like he threw mud in this guy's eyeball and just had a, like he did crazy things. I don't understand a lot about him. But I know he is the definition of love. The words that we tried to describe, someone that's outside of time, space, and matter, can only be described apophatically or negatively. The second I try to put positive words to him, I'm now shoving him inside my little box of understanding who he is. That's why a lot of people will check out of church. It's for people that are simple-minded and people that just, like, it's just, they just want just the spiritual thing and kiss this and kiss that and just whatever. It's just people that just kind of whatever. But as you can become more intellectual, all this Jesus stuff is, because it's, it's, it's outside of, it's, it, it can't fit in my logic. It's all out the door. I love this quote by an Orthodox bishop. He said this. I do not have, here we go. He said this. We see that it is not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as the cause of our wonder. I love that. I love that definition. I have to read it again. We see that it is not the task of Christianity to provide easy answers to every question. We're not here to just answer every single question. Well, prove me that God exists. Go back, go back to the story of Nathaniel. Nathaniel said, this Jesus guy, there's nothing that comes good out of Nazareth. Get him out of here. There's nothing. Like, logically, nothing comes out of that dumb city of Nazareth. What did Philip say? I don't know your answer. I don't, like, I don't have answers for you, but just come. Come and see. Just come. But to make us progressively aware of a mystery, God is not so much the object of our knowledge as the cause of our wonder. If you look at our core value again, sorry, if you look at our core value again, liturgical and personal worship points us to something so much bigger than ourselves. We intentionally wanted to say, we wanted to make a difference between liturgical and personal. This is, this is good. It's been built into your, into your habit. Sunday mornings, I'm in a church, fabulous. And, and you feel guilty if you don't, I don't want you to feel guilty, but that's another story altogether. But it's become part of your habit of liturgical worship. And for a lot of us, I clicked that box. I did my thing. I came to give Jesus owes me now. I came early. I came. I listened to the sermon. I did my, I did my job. There's communal worship. Then there's also personal worship. 
This is not a new phenomenon. This is what was beginning from the earliest records of Christianity, recorded in the book of Acts. And even further, that there is this part, but there is personal time. There is this for us to grow together. Then there's time for me to sit alone and say, where am I with him? Is it just like the, the social aspect? Is it just like the church thing and that's it? And I don't see him until next Sunday? There is a personal aspect of me sitting with him and knowing that I am here and he is here. And me giving worth to someone that is above my logic. There's communal and there's personal. You know, some people, a lot of people I've, I've sat with have told me, the communal part, there's just judgmental people. They always judge me when I come in. They say, where have I been? They judge my hair. They judge the way I dress. And it's just judgmental people. It's the worst. That's why I say, you know what? Jesus loves me. I don't need the church. Jesus loves me. It's about a personal relationship with God. I don't need the communal part. I get it. I get it. I get it, if that's your mentality. If I somehow decide, not decide, if I fall off the stage and snap my leg in half, what I say, the, the hospital is just full of sick people and it just, just infection and just judgmental people. They're going to judge me the second I walk in the door. I don't want to go there. If I just go like this, hopefully, and kind of do a side cross, everything will be, be fine on my leg. If I just pray about it, I just need personal time by myself, everything will be perfectly fine. You would think I'm an idiot if I did that. Okay, let's face it. Me to find healing in any aspect of my life involves a personal component and involves a communal component. It involves a personal intimate time and there's also a, a relational time. Both have to exist together. That's how I am made whole. That's how I'm made, that's how I'm healed. That's how I find the fullness of life. Why we said personal, liturgical and personal worship points us to something so much bigger than ourselves that it's not my logic, that it's above my logic. The past couple of days, I had a fabulous time at a leadership conference with some friends at a Christian leadership conference, and there was one line that I loved so much, I had to add it to my notes that I loved. That for a lot of us, our opinion is molded, sorry, our, our opinion is molded by a conviction. Our opinion is molded by a conviction. Our, I'm sorry, our, our opinion molds our conviction. Our opinion molds our conviction. I say, well, I believe that, you know, Jesus was this. And then I keep on saying it to myself because I heard one person say it, and all of a sudden it becomes my conviction, and I'm going to die for this, and this is what I truly believe. This is my conviction. Because now I have allowed my logic, my, I've come to show worship and reverence to my logic, to my opinion. But in reality, my conviction, my stronghold, my foundation, my, my, my rock should then give my opinion. So my question for you is, what are you wanting to worship? If you want to worship your opinion, go for it. You heard this fabulous video on YouTube and this pop, go for it. You worship your opinion, that's fine. But ask yourself, what's your foundation? What's your rock? It is, a man, it, is it a man that was 100% God and 100% man that became to, to walk with us, to become real and personal and intimate to the point of coming inside of us? Or is it based on something else? I'm not, you do your thing, but ask yourself that question. Is my opinion molded by a conviction? Or is my conviction inside then manifest itself in my opinion? Here's one thing you know for sure. One thing you know for sure. You don't get all this transcendent stuff and worship. Forget all that. There's one thing you know for sure. There are visible stuff that point to invisible stuff. There are visible stuff that point to invisible stuff. This is a dumb, well, I shouldn't say dumb, dumb but it's a ring. It's a ring. It's, I love my wife. <laughs> but it's a ring. It's a ring. Like if you ask me, do you, love, uh, do you love Sarah? Yeah, I love Sarah, don't you see? However this much was, I don't know. But this is, this is something visible that points to something invisible. This is something visible that points to something invisible. I'm not going to say, I love you, pumpkin, and I kiss the ring. This, this is not my love. This is my love to my wife. This is a reflection of my love to my wife. And that I come, I'm here to serve her and to love her unconditionally. This is something you also know as well. Here's something that's visible. 
that points to something invisible. I watched this video and you feel like if you hear a Coptic hymn, it seems very appropriate because it seems like it's, <laughs> it's just like a procession and everyone's going nuts to kiss a seven pound sterling silver trophy. Seven pounds of silver. People are going nuts to kiss it. I mean, earlier the guy was about to drop his kid just to kiss the thing. <laughs> I mean, people are just going nuts just to, just to kiss silver. Are they kissing the silver? Are they kissing for what it points to? It's a visible thing that points to something invisible. It's a visible thing that points to something invisible. Next week, my wife goes to, to Egypt for a few weeks on vacation. I'm not going to say I'm excited that I have some time to myself here, but it, it, I'm going to have three weeks of her being away with the kid, and I... I'm going to see her on FaceTime, hopefully, if the internet's okay in Egypt. <laughs> I'm not going to kiss, if I, if I miss her, I'm not going to kiss my screen. It, it, it's a reflection of my love to her. It's something visible that points to something invisible. It's not the, the phone I worship, but it's something pointing to something else. I'm stating what you already know. There was a man, many years ago, that wanted to journal his love toward God, his worship toward God, his reverence toward God. So he saw something visible, and he used it to transcend the visible to something invisible. He looked at the mountains and thought of God's majesty. He saw the rain, and he thought of God's grace toward him. He saw the sunshine, and he thought of how much God loves him. This man, that now we use his journals and our prayers, goes by the name of David. That he saw something ordinary, that pointed to something extraordinary. He saw something visible that pointed to something invisible. And this is the foundation of our ancient faith. Something that I love that we say in every Orthodox service is that we say, Lord, we offer unto you what is yours. Lord, we offer unto you what is yours. Here we have some dough that, you know, just some, some guys made. Shout out to Ramsey. And the, 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 some guys made it. Some guys made this, this, this bread. Somebody just picked up this wine from Kroger. But we offer, un this is already yours. This is already yours. You made the dough. You made the, 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 God made Ramsey's hands to make it. It's, it's already, this well, I'm offering to you what is already yours. For everything concerning everything and in everything. Why in the world are we just saying all that mumbo jumbo in liturgy? We offer, wh what we have, what is already yours. We offer unto you what is already yours. Everything that we see is already yours. Everything is already pointing to you. Everything is transcending towards you already. Something, I, I, I read this beautiful thing from an Orthodox monk. That he says, anytime I see, two, he's like working outside, and he says, anytime I see two pieces of wood outside cross each other, I venerate it. Anytime I see two pieces of wood cross each other, I venerate it. Because this two pieces of cross that cross each other reminds me of where I find my life, reminds me of where I find victory, reminds me of my purpose, reminds me of how much I'm loved. But anytime I see those two pieces of wood move, I use it to make fire. That's what he said. When they cross, I venerate it. When they're not crossed, I burn it. It's something visible that points to something so much more. The next part of, of, the, of our core value description says, our participation in the sacramental life is the foundation of our ancient faith. Intentionally wanted to word the, put the word participation. It's not us coming, looking at a screen. All right, it's almost done. Is it time to kneel? Can we kneel? You know what? I think I'll just kneel anyway and just wait until we kneel. <laughs> and we just we do that. And if I just take the body, then uh, I'm good to go. I'm good for the week. But it's actually an active participation. Actually, even the word liturgy means work of the people. That it's me working, it's you working. I'm coming with my brokenness, you're coming with your brokenness, and we're coming together toward the same physician, toward the same medicine for healing. It is work. And this is where we find participation as a church family. The last part of the mission statement says, our participation in the sacramental life is the foundation of our ancient faith and allows us to enter into a transformational life in Jesus. It's not a one and done. As I come, I've come to church the past two weeks, you know, I'll take the Sunday off. Or, you know what, I, I did good in reading this book or reading the Bible. I'm all set to go. I'm good to go. 
but it's continuous. It's a participation. It's active. It's continuous. It's transformational. I don't say I need to get in shape, you know, before family comes for Thanksgiving or Christmas. So I'm going to work out a couple of times. If I work out twice, is that going to do the trick? It's continuous. It's a lifestyle. It becomes part of who I am. Going back to taking communion versus having communion. Many of us think if I just take communion, then, you know, my, my back issue or will be fine. My diabetes will go away if I just take communion. As if it's some, like, magic pill. And we just pray to some wizard. And he just, it's not taking communion. What Jesus said that Thursday night is, I want to be one with you and you with me. I want a relationship. And this, you will live this moment. I, every time you come together, every time you come together, you broken people, every time you come together, use the visible that points to the invisible. Come together in this, you'll be outside of time. When you come together, make this present reality a divine reality. Allow this present reality to become a divine reality every time you come together in a hospital. St. Paul was trying to convince, he was in one city, in Corinth, and he saw a bunch of people starting to worship gods that they made. And he saw them worshiping all this kind of stuff, and he, and he kept saying, guys, sit down, sit down. Listen, you're not worshiping just, like, you guys just, you just carved this last Tuesday and all of a sudden you're worshiping it. That's not like, that's not a God that you worship. Like, it's great that you want to put worth to something else, but that's not the thing that you give worth to. You just made that. Okay, let's face it. You just made that. It's nothing. But in who the one you are d designed to worship, he said this, in him, and he's talking about Jesus, for us to be in him. It's not, thank you, Jesus, you're the best. In him, when I am in him and have that intimate bond with him and I'm woven into him. Jesus said to be grafted into him. If I am woven into him, in him we live. In him we move. And when in him we have our being, which is the fullness of life. It is a rela relationship. And we use the visible to point us to the invisible. God, the invisible, became visible in order to transcend us to where we're designed to live. God became man in order for man to become God. As a Coptic bishop said around the year 300, St. Athanasius, he said, God became man and in order for you and me to transcend humanity, transcend our brokenness, transcend our law, transcend my pride, transcend what I believe is right, transcend my opinion, but follow the path that leads me to life. My prayer for me, my prayer for you, is that I can use what the church, like all, this is just paper, just pr printed on alpha graphics, this is nothing. But it points to something invisible. It points to who this man was. This man that decided, I, just as my life has been rocked by following Jesus, I want to continue to bring that to this weird land of Egypt. For us, to, that's why in worship and when we work as a people in liturgy, we're using all our senses. It's, it's a holistic approach for healing. It's not coming, all right. It's, 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 it involves all. It involves our smell. It involves our, our, our body. It involves our mind. It involves our, it involves our voice. It involves every aspect of who we are. Why? Because you want healing for every aspect of who you are. I want healing for every aspect of who we are. So when we come to, to worship, that it's not just a checkbox. That it's us transcending our brokenness, transcending a slide, a PowerPoint slide, and transcending, transcending notes, but transcending that to something so much more. As David did, as everyone that has come with their brokenness to Jesus, that they have transcended their brokenness and come and said, I'm here, but you know what? There's someone that loves me. That's here. And because he loves me, I will spend time with him. I will give him the worth. I'll give him the reverence, and I will come and worship him. Let's stand up for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, there's tons of things we don't know. There's tons of things we don't understand. But Lord, you set the path for us. 
You set the path to bring us healing, to make us whole, to make us find the fullness of life. But Lord, help us not just stop just because we don't understand, but let us continue to walk toward you, toward your love, toward your grace. Let us not follow our opinion, but let our conviction and knowing that you are our Heavenly Father, let that manifest itself in our opinion and guide the steps that we make and the decisions that we take. Through the prayers of all your saints, hear us as we all pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.